<laughs> Wait for the good old delay. Yeah, the lovely YouTube delay. Oh my god. Okay, yeah, it does say live. It says live in um, my upper it says corner. live on mine. I guess I could check my YouTube feed. Okay. Yeah, it says we're live. Yeah, I see it. <laughs> 23 people are watching us do nothing. Okay. <laughs> Yay, you're live. Hello. Hello. 23 people. <laughs> Creep on in. There we go. Now I'm seeing it. Oh, yeah. Four of comments just showed up all at once. Yeah. It yeah just, there we go. It's so weird how it does that. I don't. Hello. How? Oh, my favorite. Brown nipples are supreme. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yes. Hey, hey, cast time. Ooh, more. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Funsies. Yeah, I was like, I don't know. I think it, because it happened with the last book, too, where once it became something I needed to read, I all, all of a sudden was like, oh, I don't want to read it. <laughs> like school. You yeah. Didn't like the books they made you read. And then you and read I'm them like, 10 years later, and you're like, why was this so good? Yeah. Because <laughs> I was like, oh, yeah, I can't wait to read cast. And then I'd be like, read it tomorrow <laughs> <laughs> let's see all right i mean i know oh, they're yes they're they're amazon i'll find them i'll show start, shove them somewhere in the link <laughs> they're super cheapy cheap too you know for like gaming headphones and i gotta get a I wonder how long I should wait. Well, we're here to discuss cast. I'm assuming everyone who's here has read it, maybe or maybe not. It's, it's fine. I feel like, do you think you can have spoilers for nonfiction? I keep asking, like, wondering. I'm like, because someone was like, oh, I'm not going to finish. I'm like, I think you can you can still listen because it's not like, yeah, you know, a plot twist. I mean, it's our history, right? So, like, yeah. it's not, I mean, you could just Google and find it out. You yeah, know? I, yeah. I don't think you can have spoilers for nonfiction. <laughs> Didn't reread it. Not yes. So I don't know. I hope this isn't a pattern. My mind needs to just to just go with it. But um, so well, we've got forty. That's a pretty good amount. If y'all want to go around and introduce yourselves, uh, you should know me. I'm Jess. My channel is Jess Owens. I oh no. It's probably me. It's usually no. me. No, She's the one who's international, so it's probably oh, that's internet. Right. <laughs> Do they not have good internet overseas or something? Oh no, it's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, it's terrible. <laughs> it's 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 well at yes. least in Italy is like living in two thousand and five, I swear. The music, I mean it's bad but... for my family in Venezuela too, so yeah. it's just not good some places. Mm -mm. I'm like, take me to Japan or Germany. And <laughs> yeah, goes out, if I, you know, y'all just keep going. Okay. I'll yeah, next, you got to be stationed in uh, in Germany. I don't like there aren't places in Germany. Fingers crossed. I'm ready to get off this island, Lord. <laughs> but anywho, Angela. Oh, I'm Angela. I was at the last book club. But just to be brief, my channel's <laughs> Literature Science Lines. I normally read speculative fiction. Um. Um, usually adult, I do read young adult. I read whatever I want to read with an emphasis on like trying not to just read all the same popular stuff that happens all the time. Like that still happens, but I read a lot of new releases and usually by people of color because yeah, that's just what I do. But <laughs> and yeah, that that's it. And now I'll, I'll point down to Alyssa. Oh, okay. Hello. Um, I'm Alyssa, Nerdy Nurse Reads, I think on everything but Twitter. I don't know what I am on Twitter. Um, I do have a podcast with my friend Naomi, which is called TBR Lowdown. Um, you can find that on Instagram too. Um, I read whatever the hell I want. Um, I read a lot of backlist stuff, a lot of popular things, just whatever I want, whatever strikes my fancy. Just, yeah. I, I get one life. I'm having fun. Amen. I guess Live the point your best is life. somewhere that way. That way I point. <laughs> uh, I, I feel like we're in the Brady Bunch. <laughs> uh, I'm Monet. Life is Monet on all social media platforms. I read a lot of fantasy, uh, but I also read other things as well. Lately, I've been reading paranormal romance. Been <laughs> well, it. having fun, <laughs> <laughs> and a couple of nonfictions a year. A recent nonfiction that I liked is Cultish, 
Five. I really want to read that. Yes. It was so good. I need to get that one. Yeah, I heard about that on Mara's channel when she did that whole like Scientology discussion. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, there's a little snippet in there that a person that she interviewed that was in Scientology, the, the religion, is mm -hmm. the voice on the S.C. Johnson, a family company. And so now <laughs> every time I hear it, I'm like cultish. <laughs> That's fantastic. Oh, yeah. No, they I did mean, not. Yeah. Yeah. They did not. <laughs> With Hamilton, how dare you tell me the history? <laughs> I love it. Oh, look. Oh, Monty. Hello, Monty. Hello, Monty. <laughs> yes. Yes, she's been. Okay. I've only read some of them, and I'm like, I'm just, I'm loving this journey for you. Sometimes you just need that. Yeah. I'm having like so much fun. I will admit that some of the ones I'm doing right now were like, 2003 2005 releases okay uh, but it's so funny like dragging them i'm kind of like hate reading the beginning <laughs> but also it's still kind of good though so <laughs> <laughs> it's, as it's, long as you're having fun i <laughs> find all romance like soothing to some extent it's like when you just need a break i'm like give me some trash i want it i want it. it's gonna feed my soul in all the best ways i don't want to get my trash from like sarah j mass sorry but yeah. uh, i've been Same, eating though like honestly every february i need something and then she releases a new book and i'm like yes i'm, I'm the <laughs> sequel to crescent city or house of earth and blood i'm ready so. i'm so ready <laughs> i know <laughs> jess you don't want to read it to go Stop. away <laughs> I just want I would just I would be open to it for the you know the enjoyment. I just need them to be shorter. No, <laughs> she don't... doesn't have an editor anymore. She's no. too famous. <laughs> Silver Flames, that should have had an editor. Yes. <laughs> I'm I just like I want because you know it's fun. I understand it's fun. I like to read things like that too, but I'm just like, I don't want to read 800 pages of it though. At least you got 800 pages of smut with silver flames. It's the true. 900. That's the only reason I'm not I'm not complaining because at least yeah. it was and it was a silver flame was exactly what I expected it to be with a little bit more audacity and pretending the plot mattered. I was like, excuse <laughs> me. <laughs> like, Stop like, hey, the last hundred pages. There was a story going on here. Let me let <laughs> hold me on. Let's put a story a break in. from the That's bedroom. We should probably go into cast, though. I don't think people are here to talk about our oh, Sarah J. Mass opinions. It's a book, though. Oh, look, just finished it. We, I'm so ready. proud of you. Ready to so talk. Proud of you. Um, so we can go around and just give our general feelings if you rated it, if you didn't. I, I did rate it. I gave it three stars. I don't, I just feel like with how much I heard about it, I think it, yeah, Oprah's book club pick, it was just like a top nonfiction release of last year. Um, I just expected more, like, just more from it. So it didn't feel new to me, maybe because I've read a lot of books, um, like sociology of race and stuff in the last year. So a lot of it felt repetitive um, and I mean, the audio was great, and but there were some times where I felt like there was like too many metaphors, and then to be petty, the use of the word cast, I was like, oh, okay, okay, we could, we could sub, we we know you're talking about the word cast, but yeah, I just was expecting to be like, ooh, and and tabbing it up and loving everything, and it just didn't hit my expectations. I think I gave it four stars. I mean, so I, it definitely didn't feel as useful to me, but I didn't have any expectations. I mean, I actually thought it would be probably a beginner piece into this part of nonfiction because of how popular it was. It's very rare something that's super new or, you know, groundbreaking and nonfiction is like as popular as this one. So like for sure, like the first half of it, I'm like, yeah, this this is because I mean, last year I read White Rage and um, White Supremacy and like I've read... I read the year before Just Mercy and other things. It's like, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, and I also just, I live in America. I have black friends. I, I, I know, yeah. <laughs> I know the situation. Yes. <laughs> like, but I, I think about it as like, so I'm from Ohio. There's plenty of people in Ohio who have not read a book like this whatsoever. I'm like, if I gave this to like my aunt, who is relatively like a person who probably just doesn't understand things, she would probably really like it. And I know she did use the word cast and that, and that analogy a lot, but framing things outside of the words of race and white supremacy makes things, I think, a lot more palatable. Mm -hmm. So, like, if I gave that to, like, my rich white aunt, she wouldn't feel attacked, and then she would maybe listen. Yeah. And, like, and that's sometimes a thing, but 
in terms of myself and what did I learn? I mean, I did suddenly have some connections. So like I'm sort of biracial. I don't know. I'm very confused about my race and I have been my whole life because I'm Venezuelan and white American. And I was just like, why am I so confused all the time? And this book kind of helped me because it's like, oh, because it is just arbitrary nonsense, yeah. which I, I always knew, but I was just like, so that yeah. was something. And then there were like some medical stuff. That I'm like, oh, I didn't know. And then other like, oh, duh moments that I just hadn't read in another book yet. So it wasn't groundbreaking, but I think it did what it meant to do, but I thought it was a little long. And part four was just so discombobulated. I was like, what is the point of each chapter in part four? Yes. Like, I, it's not cohesive to me. Yeah, okay. So, yeah. yeah. So I don't know. It was, <clears throat> I, I, I think if it was your first piece on race and you were like a white person in America, this would be revolutionary. Mm -hmm. I don't think yeah. any of us here, this is our first book on, yeah. on race. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> It's not, it's not my first book I race, that's for sure. But I, I did, I think I might be the only one who really liked it, which is probably not surprising as the white person that I, I really liked it. Because I, I feel like, especially, you know, considering I'm almost 40 years old, uh, I don't feel like we were taught fully a lot of things in school. And as somebody who spent most of their, like, secondary schooling in the sciences and outside of anything sort of beyond a lab, um, I didn't get that like humanities piece of my education. So now in my adulthood, I'm going back and I'm getting, filling in a lot of gaps that were more like buzzwords. And now I'm getting depth beyond the buzzwords. So I found it a very powerful story, especially to recommend to other people to open their mm -hmm. eyes, like you were saying, Angela. And I just, I, I found her writing very um, approachable, which I find can be very hard with nonfiction to get people to read something and be engaged, which I really just find her engaging in general as an author. So I found it, I I just, I loved, I liked it. I thought it was yeah. good. And I'm really interested to hear other people's points on it because obviously we all have our different lived experiences and our different mm -hmm. things that we're bringing to the table. Um, but I, I mean, I think it has value um, and I think we'll all value it differently, but I think it definitely has value as a teaching tool because um, mm -hmm. there's a lot of stuff that, you know, a lot of people don't necessarily know or know, know how little they know about yeah. something. Okay. And and she doesn't pull any punches, I feel like, at certain points with her phrasing. Like, there are things that she says that can really hit people the, just the right way, I feel like. Like, the the whole, like, even the one, I keep saying this, I feel like I've said it a thousand times, but, like, the one drop rule was too far for Hitler. Like, when you hear that phrase, oh yeah, especially as a white person, that, like, it's really hard to deny. Yeah inside yeah. you can't you can't start doing that, that yeah when, when you learn it's that really from... hard to do that. Yeah. <laughs> no uh yeah when i heard i was like wait let me go back and i was like did she just ain't no way so yeah that was a, definitely a standout part i didn't um i didn't because realize i never that. really like thought of it like that and when you phrase it like that suddenly you're like oh shit <laughs> yeah we've really fucked up <laughs> like, like, but I, I, I enjoyed it. Oh, I feel like I'm going to end up being the most critical person. No, no, no. no. Be critical. <laughs> Bring um, it. For me, one of the first things that I did not love is that a lot of the topics weren't fleshed out. Um, and this is me as a historian, someone who has studied history. Her writing approach was so palatable. Palatable to where I feel like she could have expanded upon events and uh, important themes and still have made it understandable. There's a lot of like historian jar, like, you know, jargon that people would not understand, but I feel like this was the perfect setup to maybe give a few more details as to how critical things will be. Um, and for example, in America, like she kept talking about how America is different in our caste systems, um, to like other European countries. And one of them, like one of the pillars of that is, you know, our foundation around capitalism. And I feel like she should have touched on that. And it probably would have expanded the perspective of people like to understand like we are completely driven by capitalism yes. and have always been driven by capitalism. And one downfall of capitalism is that exploitation is to be expected. Someone has to take the short end of the stick in order mm -hmm. to make a lot of money and have low overhead costs. Someone gets the short end of the bag. And so in our effort to make sure that there's always someone to be exploited, uh, 
we have like this caste system. And so that's one thing that I did not appreciate. Another thing is America is so focused on black and white. And there are a lot of conversations that leave indigenous people out and that leave, you know, Latino people out. And I feel like by calling it caste, it created an umbrella to where she could have talked about some of the plights that we share as lower mm-hmm. caste people. Mm-hmm. Um, and it could have included way more races because while black people are the pillars of the caste system um, and, you know, we're the first ones at the bottom, they did subsequently add more people. Um, and I feel like in terms of like just indigenous culture period, it's a book that further left them out of the conversation. And if we're talking about, for example, comparison to the Dalits, how she was saying how the, uh, the original structure didn't include them. They were untouchable. They weren't even mentioned in the original uh, setup. Indigenous people weren't original. They're, they're still yeah. not mentioned. Yeah. So there was so many more impactful comparisons that I feel like she could have made. Um, and so many more, like she did sometimes say, oh, you know, towards the end, she was saying if we combine our struggles with the indigenous uh, struggles and the Latino struggles, we could make something. But it was just like at the end of the book, you glossed over them to the point where we could have all felt unity. Um, it said, for example, the Irish uh, immigrants, when they first got to America, they were part of the lower caste system and they separated Irish immigrants from black people, even though we shared uh, some of the same experiences. And so they used race to pull us apart. And I feel like caste could have could have brought us all back together. Uh, so that's why I feel like this book could have been way more impactful. And it could have made us see that although I'm black and I, you know, I have grapples with the government and I have, you know, you know, ancestral problems that makes me upset. I can mm-hmm. look at my indigenous neighbor and look at my Mexican neighbor and be like, you know what? We all deserve reparation. We all deserve justice. And I feel like this book could have done that. And mm-hmm. it so. No, those are all good, good points. I did, I like at the end found it weird that she was throwing that in there. I didn't think about that for like the whole thing. Cause I knew that was kind of her focus, but it does. Now that you say that, I'm like, yes, she did. <laughs> yeah, the only time she brings it up is more in how other races, you know, kind of have to figure out where they fall into this binary mm-hmm. that is set up. So I feel like it was kind of like wrongly pitched to call it cast and then not talk about all aspects of cast. Like this book was about black plights and how it relates to like Nazi Germany and the Dalis yeah. in India. And that's fine. And it should have been pitched like you know, let's talk about race or the black plight or like it shouldn't have been yeah. called caste if you were only going to focus on African-Americans. Caste, the origins of our black discontents. It should have been called that. <laughs> <laughs> That's like what I, I expected and what I ate, you know, like I expected a full course meal. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I wonder, you know, like how like titles aren't always something an author gets to have a say into, like they have their mm-hmm. title and then the publisher has theirs and then there's like this whole mess of how you get to the final one. I wonder what that story was like, like what parts each person wanted to be in the title. And like, obviously I think cast was always going to be a part of the title because cast is such a big part of the book, but, and I was the other part. They probably, they were like, let's, we'll save the blackout. Just, (laughs) yeah. (laughs) I'll be more marketable. One chapter on like indigenous culture and like catching people up, you know what I'm saying? Like Black people, while we have our amplified voices, uh, it's because we're a larger community. So, you know, we can make a, we can make a lot of noise. But I feel like showing what was happening to other people at the same time, you could have mm-hmm. did a subsection of like, you know, what was happening to Mexicans and what was happening to yeah. people. Like, I feel like even just one section would have been yeah. better. Well, especially since like chapter four, when it just had all of those examples, which I, I get that there was a point, but like, I think it flirts with the whole like, trauma porn aspect of things like you have space we could have like I don't know I don't know if you needed all of those examples like for sure you need some but there were a lot I I felt that that I was like (laughs) another one and just like I said I felt like stuff became repetitive so that would have been something different to add in to talk about other groups of people because I'm like okay you've argued this now I get it you've given me a lot of examples I get it yeah, um, the sequel wait there's yeah. more Sarah that's perfect <laughs> but yeah I did like I already knew because I've taken anthropology and like talked to you know talked about or learned about race really just being created but I did like that part um talking about that because it is you know just even the origin of the word Caucasian it doesn't you know they're not from the Caucasus Mountains like um <laughs> just this silly stuff like that so something like that where like I kind of already knew it 
that did, I feel like was useful and definitely, you know, for someone who, like we said, maybe isn't, hasn't read a book like this. And then I did see in the, I don't know if it was on Twitter, on Discord, but people were saying, you know, like who were reading it from Europe found that they got a lot more out of it, which would make sense if you're not, you know, a part of United States. And, you know, I know you see a fair amount on the interwebs, but. Yeah. <laughs> um, Do you think some of the failing of the book is because it was um, from the get go more commercial and less um, like academic of a exercise? And so she has to pull back in certain spots to make it marketable and, and actually sellable to a larger audience, as opposed to writing like a strictly historical tome. Yeah. I will I, say that I think that that's true in a way that, like I said, Black people, we make a lot of noise. And so we've had more progress with social movements and protests mm -hmm. than other uh, communities. And I feel like her making this book a, a Black book made it way more sellable because books about Mexican plights don't yeah. sell as much. Yeah. Books about indigenous plights don't sell as much. And um, so I do think that like making it black made it way more like marketable. Yeah. yeah. Monet, yeah. look, we waiting on your book. <laughs> Put us on the pre-order list. <laughs> I would say that like there were a lot of pros to comparing it to cast I think because like it's really early in the book when she's talking about how she could tell who someone was in a caste system at like some convention in India mm -hmm. just by how they hold themselves and I'm like yeah. that's not dissimilar to here like if we were literally to remove everyone's like color you know like truly colorblind not just the people who like I don't see color right <laughs> like someone who is confident in walking through life because they haven't had to face the stresses of a system acts mm -hmm. differently than someone who has had to face the stresses. And I don't know, I also did like how the book talked about how those stresses actually do have medical consequences and yeah. the different medical, like I thought yeah. that was really cool. Yeah, like, There were nuggets like that. And I had to just try to turn off my brain being like, I'm so done hearing about 2020. Like I can't even anymore. Like I get, oh, no. I get it. And I didn't try to knock the book for that, but I was like, I, I lived it. I'm good. Yeah. I'm, done. <laughs> I'm amazed at how many books have managed to cover 2020 and like, it's, like all the non-fictions I've been reading have that central point and I'm just like everybody went back to the editor and like, yes put, like, put it in. yeah they were like I got one more let me put this in I got one more chapter and I'm like no I did like that point because when she was talking about and also th this ties in uh to when talking about race how when people immigrate from like a country in Africa and come to America and then they're like you know we're you know there's not you're not black, you're just African. And then coming here in American or just immigrants in general who want to make sure like, no, I'm from the Dominican or no, I'm from Ghana. I'm from Nigeria. I'm not African-American because they already realized that the racism that's against African-Americans. And then um, I just lost my point. Yep. <laughs> well, there was a part with the health thing I was talking about where like, there's not a higher rate of diabetes or blood pressure yes. oh, yeah, like in, in Africa. Africa. Mm -hmm. That just happens here in America. because of food yeah. as well but there's other factors yeah like the guy who was like my dad you know didn't have these things his whole life and now I and like 40 years before that have um pre-diabetic and I have high blood pressure um there was like something like this that was touched on on the book black fatigue and I was like oh I want to read more about like the medical effects we and don't people recommend we don't get taught how to see things. Sorry, Jess, I'm interrupting. No, you don't right. get taught how to see different things on other skin tones. Like if you look in a, like most textbooks, everything is on light or fairer skin mm, yeah. um, people. So even just seeing that somebody's cyanotic, you have to, there's, there's like a throwaway line in your textbook. That's like, Oh, we look for something else. Um, Cause you're not going to see it on darker skin. And you're like, okay, well then show me. I know there was somebody um, who was making medical uh, textbooks specifically to show different things on different colors of skin so that medical professionals could actually treat people appropriately, yeah. um, which, which we were not being taught and it's a failing of the system. And then you add layer in a whole bunch of other failings, um, like just assuming you don't feel pain or you all these other random Tough assumptions skin. that we, yeah. we like to have. Um, and you're, you're now you're underserving an entire population well, and like and to their of, health detriment. And yeah. because of race, when you, well, cause we have these arbitrary boxes, people have to fill out at the doctor's office, which like, why I don't understand. Cause it actually doesn't have a medical bearing. Your socioeconomic position does, but not, not your race, but 
when they do studies, when they're testing drugs and stuff, if you are suddenly Latino or, you know, what Latina or whatever, they won't use you because then it's too complicated. It's like, mm -hmm. well, are you white or are you black? And it's like, well, this shouldn't matter. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, they're so, I, so suddenly it's just, you're removed and you're not in that study anymore. The system, one of the books that was recommended to me about that topic, if you want, I haven't read it yet. I'm going to read it next month for nonfiction November, but it's medical apartheid. And I know I'm going to be mad reading it, but <laughs> I'm going to read it because I wanted to learn more about like the effects of racism and like prejudice that, and just the history of uh, health or lack thereof in, in this country. But yeah, I did like that comparison because I would just assume, cause you know, like I would just assume they refer to themselves as black or they had the same, you know, predisposition to illnesses that we have being from America. So that was really interesting to learn that that's, that's different. Um, I feel, uh, there. feel like marginalized communities, you can tell because they have less organic options at the grocery stores, way more mm -hmm. McDonald's and fast foods in the neighborhood. Uh, so I do feel like it is possible and it's true that we have higher like comorbidity, comorbidity rate. Uh, but that's, not because of our skin color and more because of what they put in our school systems, what they put in our neighborhoods. And, you know, I can't tell you how close a Whole Foods is to the neighborhood I grew up in. I didn't know that Whole Foods was a thing until, you know, you have to, like, these are stores that you have to drive 45, 50 minutes yeah. to get to. And meanwhile, there's McDonald's. And expensive. Yeah. yeah. So and yeah, unless you're in the city, then suddenly, I mean, I live in Boston, so this is Boston based information. Whole Foods is cheaper than Star Market, which is their Shaw's or Kroger's <laughs> or whatever. Uh -huh. it, well, yeah, if you're buying like desert. bread and yeah, milk, like desert. if you're buying yeah, sliced mangoes, then yes, that's seven dollars. Don't do that <laughs> unless you have yeah. that money and want the mangoes. Yeah, because <laughs> like or people who maybe if you only have limited stores, then you don't have transportation to get yeah. to somewhere yeah. else that has better produce and stuff um but yeah i'm gonna yeah I'm that's, gonna struggle with that's point. Yeah. but back to the i know someone brought it up because they said they liked the comparisons um and so i i feel like a lot of people i don't know if you all were familiar with the caste system in india like i knew about it i didn't know a lot about it but i knew of it but i really thought it was i didn't realize even though i've read a lot of like historical stuff and not like historical fiction stuff about Nazi Germany and then obviously about the slavery time in America but I never thought to like never yeah. thought to compare them or like think that somebody else was looking at us as an example like I just was like oh they're just two separate terrible things and so I found that really interesting the comparisons and then like we talked about that one the one drop and seeing how they were looking at America I'm like how especially when she said I can't remember the quote but it was something like America is able to like make themselves look so good in the media but they're still while keeping their like minority class down, but you know, they still have like a good international presence. And I'm like, mm, yeah. isn't that something? Okay, this last comment, Salter Ooh. A. Yeah. <laughs> Our uh, <laughs> also traverses licensure like cosmetology. You have to pass the white culture hair exams, even if you only treat black textures and expert. Oh. Still I am a licensed cosmetologist, and I will <laughs> tell you that there is no test in which you have to know black hair. You mm -hmm. only have yeah. to know, and I, and I don't want to say black hair, but as yeah. long as you know how to treat straight, fine, uh, mm. hair, you will get your license. Any type of curl. And it don't even have to be on a black person. Any type of curl, unless it's a perm that I did, taking your straight fine hair to curly hair, it's not required for you to get your license. Uh, so y'all just keep that in mind when you go to a salon and you're like, how can this person not know how to do hair? You only need to know how to do Barbie. And, um, wow. <laughs> you know, and that makes a lot of sense because I was in a wedding recently and I'm, I was the only one in the bridal party with this curly hair which is mixed and it, it acts mixed all the time this is the part of me that's the most mixed of the, world. <laughs> the world doesn't know how to handle and the, the person they were like doing me first and I was like because I knew I'd be complicated with my curls and she's like yeah just come with clean dry hair and I'm like if I show up and I don't shower before with my hair it's just it's just a little frizzy afro and if I don't put product in after I go to bed like what do you have you ever worked with curly hair like I was <laughs> I was very concerned this is not gonna work Ma'am. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, it, re- it made me very upset when I was getting my license. And I'm like, I paid a pretty penny. I paid like a equivalent to a college degree, uh, college AA, to attend this school. And as long as I can do highlights and a cut. They were fine with it? They were totally fine with it. And I'm like, you guys yeah. are charging 20K, $20,000 just to go to this school and don't teach how to braid, how to do extensions, how to do relaxers, nothing. Uh. It doesn't yeah, surprise yeah. me because when I was getting married, I remember I had my, my one of my bridal parties. She's one of my best friends. And she's Dominican. And I was like, you know how to do Dominican hair. Like not my hair, like Dominican <laughs> hair. And I would go around and I was like, do you, do you? Because you're going to have to do all these people. And, <laughs> and, and I, I'm not like, do you? And and it was hard to find somebody that could do everybody. Um, and I didn't really think about it until I was sitting there and interviewing them. I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> Just wait a second. Uh, like, it sounds really bad, but like people of color are the best hairstylists because they learn their hair growing up or like, you know, doing it culturally. And then when they go to school to get their license, they learn white hair. And mm-hmm. so if you want a very versatile style, mm-hmm. it's more than likely going to be a person of color. You have more luck with a black woman knowing how to do your white hair than you mm-hmm. will have with a white woman knowing how to do your I feel hair. like that's what makeup too. When I got, when I eloped and I was looking for a makeup artist and I would like look and they would say that they did like darker skin. And I was like, but you, none of your pictures are any models. <laughs> and then I like would see one and I'm like, oh no, ma'am, that is, you know, like, <laughs> that is many shades just lighter. And I like eventually found someone, but yeah, just like stuff like that, that just makes life, you know, something that just should be easy, like getting your hair done or getting, you know, and just another, another notch. Oh, complication. Life difficult. Um, let me see these. Yeah, I just it was so crazy. I mean, it was that was one of my oh duh moments. Like, of course, but like, yeah, yeah. But I just never thought about it. But you're like, it when, makes when someone says the words, you're like, oh fuck. Okay. With, uh, with this comment, she mentioned how Hitler took away things that was applied to Black people in America and and used it for the Jewish people. The kerosene baths that he made them bathe with, and like the gas chambers, actually came from. America's treatment of its Mexican immigrants. And that's what I mean when I say she neglected to mention mm-hmm. very important things because they weren't just inspired by the treatments of Blacks. They were inspired by the treatments of the whole bottom cast. And yeah. so, yeah. Oh, that's really, yeah. That, And that's not that hard to make. That, that's two sentences. like barely. Yeah. Uh, they were talking about how Mexicans came across the border dirty. And so they made them bathe in kerosene baths. And he used it for his gas chambers. The same uh, chemical makeup. And it was crazy that in America, in El Paso, it actually started like a gel fire. And so people died. It was like kind of like a genocide. And so he altered the chemical because it was so cruel in this using of like for Mexicans in America that he kind of changed it uh, with his scientists because he was How like- How many ways does Hitler change things that we've done? <laughs> How did he make it slightly less, less horrible? Bad. Like, that's a book in itself. <laughs> that, can you, that book would sell the title like that. How Hitler's not as bad as the Jim Crow South. Like, <laughs> oh, God. You know what's crazy? That book would be packed full of information. I would love to be an editor on that one. Why don't you just write it? No, they just write it. Writer, just like, write it. Something. I just want to say her writing style is way less scholarly. And I was telling my friends when I was on Zoom reading it that like in a scholarly environment, I feel like she would have been slaughtered. Uh, but because this isn't- But a she's book, a journalist. She, yeah. she was always a journalist. Yeah. So it's about- engaging the public with, with the public yeah. and i feel yeah. like well, the writing is good for that yeah 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 mm-hmm. but it's definitely why i like i feel like it's a really good conversation starter book it is a good intro book i feel like it's a good high school book like to introduce topics to to in a way that people can understand them and then you can start talking about all these things and layer in other topics and have a framework um to dive deeper into yeah. a lot of the bullshit that has been going on for centuries that we've been covering up and ignoring and have and still trying to penalize teachers for teaching um when they're like it's critical race theory no what you're talking about is just history okay like we're not we're not getting getting i found a one of the earlier quotes i did tab that was um that I like because she was talking about how people, you know, often are like, it's slavery, that was over a hundred years ago. Like, get over it. And like we how we just 
people like to just like move past it like it was just this blip on our timeline. But she said, Americans are loath to talk about enslavement in part because what little we know about it goes against our perception of our country as a just and enlightened nation, a beacon of democracy for the world. Slavery is commonly dismissed as a sad, dark chapter in the country's history. It is as if the greater the distance we can create between slavery and ourselves, the better to stave off the guilt or shame it induces. And I was like, mm. like that was the past. Yes. Why are you bringing up the past? When she said that in 2111, Black people would have been free as long as they had been enslaved, I'm like, I'm not going to see that. And my kids are like, 2011? <laughs> yeah, I so far like that, I was like, She's definitely good at, and this is probably coming from being a journalist, making those almost soundbite moments that mm -hmm. stick with you and really can hook you in. So I, I, I'm going to stand by. I think it's a good intro book. Yeah. But um, there is a book, which if you haven't read it, Monet, I feel like you might like it. It's The New Age of Empire. It's written by this guy whose name I can't remember, but he's a teacher. Uh, he's a teacher. He's a professor, I think, in Leeds or Manchester. And it is much more of a call to action. And he breaks down the, oh, the long-lasting effects of colonization. And basically, at the end of it, you're waiting for him to give you you know, something. Um, and his basic summation is, no, you have to dismantle everything because mm -hmm. it's just absolutely effed up. And and it is. And it, there's a mm -hmm. long, long, far-reaching effects of colonization. And anybody who is a colonizer cannot wash themselves clean of this. If you went into mm -hmm. a nation and colonized them, you have greatly affected those peoples for generations. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to check it out. I'll put it on my Goodreads. Do it. Another I thing I thought one. was um, really <laughs> interesting with this is um, how it compared our form of slavery to other past slavery. Because, I mean, I feel like we all, <clears throat> from like, you know, Bible or ancient Greece or whatever, we all are like, yeah, slavery has been around forever. We weren't the first ones. We were just continuing a bad system. That's all, like, I feel like that's like what people think when mm -hmm. they first learn about slavery and like how much more aggressive and dehumanizing our version was. Yeah. And like, I happened to be reading a fantasy book at the same time as reading that. And that author did a really good job of showing the first days of slavery where you aren't quite ready to dehumanize this person you have as a slave, which would have been like the beginning part that she does talk about in this book where at first when people came over, there's like necessary evil. And then, you know, give it a generation and it's suddenly like these people deserve to be there. Otherwise, you know, how would they even eat and survive? You know, mm -hmm. they're just, you know, like it's, I don't think that, I mean, that's not taught at all. Like when you learn about ancient world history, you kind of lightly touch on their versions of slavery, but you don't realize they're more like really extreme indentured servants who can buy yeah. their way out. There yeah. was no equivalent of that in America. I feel like, for example, like in comparison with the Dalits, their religion is directly correlating to their position in society. Mm -hmm. But what America does is, for example, like touching on what you said, America is the first time that race played a part in slavery. It was never mm -hmm. off race until America. But what they yeah. do is they have all these systems that are put in place, like all these reasons for why they do what they do. And then they pull the hand and leave the ball dangling. So it just becomes the way of life and you don't really know who to blame anymore. Because like, for example, using Christianity to say that oh. we had of Cain uh, and to say that we were Cain's descendants and that's why we are enslaved. They mm -hmm. used to say that, but now they don't. But there's still the negative connotation around like what that provided to like society without knowing who to pinpoint. They throw the ball and they hide their hand and they leave us figuring out, you know what I'm saying, how are we to figure this out? And I feel like with India, they knew exactly who to blame and who, mm -hmm. to, you know, whatever. And then even with Germany, you know exactly who was to blame, but ours is such an imaginary systematic oppression that we, there's not a single part of America that we can gut out and be like, this is the raw part. This is the part that needs to be amputated because at this point, the virus is literally running through the, the body of our country. And there's not one section that we can pinpoint. Yeah, the cancer is metastasized. It's yes, everywhere. Yes. It's <laughs> it is everywhere. I think um, it was towards the end of the book, but it still fits in here when she talked about, um, like in Nazi Germany, when Hitler is coming and all these people are standing outside and they're cheering all of the people who used to go to these lynchings and like they would dress up, they would make a day of it, they would take photos, they would have a picnic. And she was like, I know you're you're probably listening to like, I would never do that, but just like it took, it was just ordinary people. And I really, yeah. for a second, I was like, ah, oh, girl, I would not be doing that. And then, but it just is interesting because she was like, 
the the pro the reason it's hard to solve these issues because the problem is people like it's mm -hmm. us there's you know we have this one fanatic person that of course she talks about donald trump the orange oh studio, god That's not um as an example <laughs> but mm -hmm. uh, you get just enough you get one person who just goes with it one person and just enough regular people who may on the surface don't you know think they're doing something wrong or one person who's joining in with the rest of the people are like, oh, I don't want to be ostracized or I don't want to speak out against this. And that made me think like, what, like, what would you do? What would if I do yeah, in, from peer pressure? You know, certain times I want to say I wouldn't, but just those, she was like, but they were just regular people. Like, you know, probably a spectrum of terrible to, you know, not, but they just went with it. And I'm just, I want to believe I would but <laughs> you wouldn't just but that makes me like when i read things or like look at stuff from like uh the like civil rights movement i'm like would i have been out there in the streets or would i have been at home i don't i don't know but i just thought that was interesting because it really is like it's just something it's really hard things like this are hard to pinpoint because it's not just one thing you can say here's the problem and get rid of it it's like like y'all just said it's like a disease it's well and, and monet brought it up at the beginning and something that really probably should have been a bigger part of it is like it's the normal people in the power class who end up doing these things and in here we're in the power class when we have the most money so we can buy the things and do whatever because it is our capitalistic drive mm -hmm. so like i don't know if that's completely dismantled what happens <laughs> but like that's a large part of it and it's not really brought up on how this is a driving force of how one has the power in our country because it really is i mean Okay, a black person with the same amount of money as a white person does not have the same power, but mm -hmm. yeah, they should, but they don't. You yeah. know, lynching that Monty mentioned, black people weren't the only people lynched. I mm -hmm. feel like there was so many moments in this book where she could have been like, you know what, black people when they lynched them, it was a celebration. Uh, but like for example, talking about Mexicans again, they would lynch them by the hundreds and walk away. They didn't mm -hmm. even stay to have a celebratory moment. It was just a, yeah, you know, and and. I just, she should have mentioned this. I want to talk to her and be like, can we just rewrite it? Ma'am. <laughs> Ma'am. Monet will be right Monet here. Monet has questions. On, on the revision. Like Monet's version of Cat. <laughs> Remix. <laughs> and I remember that being like impactful when I learned, you know, through my history classes that black people weren't the only ones lynched. Like that was, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a thing that they did not just the black people. It almost felt like, a personal attack because I'm like it wasn't even special to us like it was it went to everybody that's crazy to me it wasn't even like that, <laughs> that makes me think of like when I for a long time you know learning about World War II and Nazi Germany just assumed it was all Jewish people and then learn later learning that there were black people and queer people and like mm -hmm. Romani like all there were more than just Jewish so I feel like that's making that's what that's reminding me of like yes it is I think because of our history with America is so black and white, like the white people brought the black people here, but there were also people here when they got here. And then obviously we're literally a country of immigrants. Mm -hmm. And so, but I think because of the like political and like social climate that's been going on in America really since like, I feel like, well, it's always been happening, but really since, I think she talks about it in the book, marking it as like the era basically when Trayvon Martin was murdered onward. And I feel like the stuff like this focus specifically on black and white are very marketable right now because, you know, the people who are like, oh yes, I want to learn. I want to read things. And it's easier just to, just to focus in on that instead of encompassing other groups. Um, because not like we don't, we have issues. Yes. With black people in America, but there's the border. Crisis. We have a lot of issues. It's yeah, there's just, issues with we don't just really, have one. You know, groups with Asian Americans and just all this diff. But you know, they probably I don't know. Maybe she had and wider like research, and they were like, like narrow it. We just uh, want about black. But even then, it's not a very narrowed work. It's 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 like yeah. I would see that if it was tighter. But it's not a tight piece of nonfiction. Like that's my biggest like structural. I'm not talking about the content critique. Like it's a little too long for what it is saying. Yeah. Yes, and like. And I'm not even saying that the repetition's bad. I'm saying the repetition of the repetition. Like, there's a lot. Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not that we're saying something once, twice, or three times. We're saying it six or eight. Like, it was very repetitive. But 
Yeah. I think in terms Monty making me laugh. Stop I know Monty's it. Monty's <laughs> dark humor all the way. Um, but I I feel like these things get easier to um explain away when one group finds a way to make all other groups less than human compared to them. And then suddenly everything that you morally might have gone, oh, that's not right. You go, oh, but that's different because it's the other. It's not me. It's the other. Where They are other to me. So yeah, somebody in here said they can't statistically all be sociopaths. They're not yeah. statistically all sociopaths, but they are statistically people that are somehow through generations been brainwashed into thinking that there still is a difference between us and them, whoever us yeah. and them is in this particular scenario. Or and with somebody this, is the power yeah. in that scenario. Or they're just people who, and I mean, not to say it down, just people who are afraid to stand up. I, was it, I'd be running, I'm pretty sure it was in this, there was like a little boy who like wrote a note to a classmate. No, he was like working at a shop. Or like a store, yes. And, like a, and he expressed his like general liking. Yeah, for just it. like, oh, I just like, you know, I want you to be my friend or something like that. I mean, he had like um, a little crush, but he wasn't being absurdly yeah. creepy. He just like, and, you know, and showed that note and just, uh, just so many things like that. But then I have to wonder, and obviously I was not alive during that time, but I think of like a lot of adaptations and stuff I've seen depicting that time when there's like a person who is like, well, I don't think that, but they're too afraid to challenge what their friends or family or church leader or whatever thinks. And so how many people, I'm sure there was a ton of people who, there's so many people who were like, oh, you're black, don't touch me. But then other people who are like, oh, that doesn't really make sense, but I'm also not gonna challenge you because you might have me and I'm not gonna go against you. I'm just gonna go with it. And like, yeah, tribalism, like, well, I don't wanna, I don't wanna be the odd man out over here. Y'all gonna hurt me. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna share I mean, a little I think... snippet, I guess, about like the tribalism concept. Uh, I remember in like 10th grade, I wrote a paper. Um, learning about like, uh, what was it? The revolution and like loyalists and stuff like that. And my paper was basically saying that I would have been a British loyalist if I was alive. And that's so like anti-patriotic American. And the entire class and my teachers like, you know, they fought for our freedom. And I'm like, Britain abolished slavery 60 years before America. My people would have been free for 60 years earlier <laughs> had we not had America win that war. So for me as a black person, even though I am American, for me as a black person to think about what those 60 years meant for my ancestors, mm -hmm. I hate to say it, I feel like I would have been like, you know, Britain's not that bad. Britain's yeah, not but, that but bad. on the flip side, Britain lost and then continued to to help with the whole slave trade. So it's not yeah. like, you know, nobody's hands are unclean in this whole scenario. Mm -hmm. And it's, yeah, and like just to your thing, I actually I think what it comes down to is like I think act like I say this because I have family members who I do know still have like bad takes, not even bad takes, like horrendous approaches to how they see the other, unless they finally meet a person who humanizes the concept for them. Mm -hmm. And like I think they might agree that maybe a, a punishment would be too harsh, but that there was a wrong done. Like, I think they would be like, oh, yeah, of course they, they should be mad that this their white daughter was approached by this black boy that's so, like, out of line. And maybe internally they'd be like, but that kid probably shouldn't have been killed, but they were in the wrong. Like, I mm -hmm. think that's probably more the average take is maybe. Yeah. And then not speaking out because, like, then they're going to be judged by their neighbors when, because I don't think people are that progressive on average once you have something dehumanized so much. Yeah, mm -hmm. no. I, um... Every time I start to think of something, it falls out of my head and I do not appreciate it. <laughs> but um, the something I'm going to try to, I was thinking about this before the live and I don't know how to, I'm just going to try to explain it the best way. But when you were talking earlier, Monet, about like capitalism, because she does touch on that. And then when she's explaining caste <laughs> in America and obviously us being the bottom cast or whatever, black people. I And she talked about like how, her examples with like flying in first class and, you know, getting judged because she's a black woman and they assume that she's not supposed to be in here. But then talking, when you were talking about like capitalism explo exploits the lower caste, I wish she would have talked about like the, because obviously every black person is not a poor person. Um, 
the differences within she did touch on it with like colorism, but the differences within even black people and like the ones who get money and like are act different versus, you know, the ones who are middle class to lower. Like I kind of wanted, I don't know where, but there were some times where I was like, is she, and she, she didn't go there because those, you know, a lot of those people turn their back and act like there hasn't been any struggle or pretend, you know, that everybody else basically gaslighting other black people, yeah. like, I've never experienced racism. And well, well, they I, found that American dream. Yeah, yeah. They're like, I just did it by myself. I worked hard and, you know, and I was, I was like, oh, I want her. And she didn't, she didn't go there. Um, but that American know, they, dream needs to be shot. I hate yeah. the American dream. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't know it was still Booster around. One more time. Well, the American dream is pretty much still a thing, especially for um, immigrants who want to come to America. They want to achieve it. We here, we know it's not feasible. Nobody's reached it in generations. But I believe it's still kind of like an international thing where you can go there and have this upward mobility. Uh, at least they think that it is. So. It is the conservative tagline that, you know, America is the land of plenty and whatever. But if you work hard, you just pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. You can have it all. Well, you can't. You can't. We are. In, we are like this all. is like the first generation that's not going to be as wealthy as the generation before it. We are in a decline. I am already like, older doesn't freaking than my mom matter. was when she bought a house. Like I am behind. <laughs> Capitalism, or at least our version of it, is like a mind fuckery. Excuse my language. Because no, I've already dropped we will make you, or our capitalism will make you think that. Even though you start the race way behind your white counterparts with way more baggage, that if you don't reach what was attainable to you, it's your fault. Yep, not your fault. We internalize it and we the make system it. System is fault. It's fault. Yeah. the system is no, fault. No, but it's like I have had every advantage, <laughs> and I am never gonna reach what my parents have reached. Yeah. I, and they have given not, me. For not every, it's, it's our fault for not saving. It's I can't get not. there. <laughs> Generational wealth. <laughs> never heard of her. No. And I, thought it is, I mean, and the big one there is how college, like the student loans is, I think, our big bubble. Because like even my yeah. stepdad, who is black and like he went to school at Purdue and he's like, well, I was just able to do X, Y, Z and I could go to college. And like your college costs like 2000 a year yeah. and I don't care about inflation. Like yeah. that's not the same. <laughs> like it's so yes it was uh, when i was a teenager i started my own landscaping company and i <laughs> low, low monopolies you can't you can't do anything anymore like yeah. even now you can't like just start a youtube channel and suddenly have like five hundred thousand subscribers like that ship sailed you're not gonna make it like you can't you gotta dance on tiktok and then you maybe Bitcoin, you're the reason you're for i love this comment i'm sorry <laughs> I believe it's it's Demi Demi <laughs> <laughs> Have you guys it's heard my um... <laughs> I love that. <laughs> um, exactly. I, I have a batch. It's just I have two yeah, of them. And the only reason I have a job is because I got a license to do yeah. something specific. It's, like, it, like you said, Bonet, it's just like, um, well, you should be here. So it's like, well, maybe you work harder. And this person has already has three jobs. Maybe you and stuff like, well, make, you know, the whole framing. That's the biggest fallacy is the, oh, they're just not working hard enough. Yes, Every well, like immigrant person that I've ever met, however I've met them in my life, has worked harder than any just mm -hmm. like but privileged but white person. Lazy, right? Has, like, had more always... jobs takes on more responsibilities, has less opportunities, like less access to everything. And they work their freaking asses off mm -hmm. so that their kids can survive and have a better life. Well, and, and also there is the the flip immigrant though. There is the the wealthy immigrant, which my dad oh, yeah. was one of those. And he, he was kind of lazy and not good at things and it didn't work <laughs> out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just like, like you can't say all for you know everything, right? Well, I'm like, just saying like that also happens. Absolutes don't work. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. When people are like, "What? You know, um, black people aren't oppressed." Look at Michael Jordan. Look at you know. It's like, come on now. Look at Oprah. These are exceptions. These are outliers. Did y'all? Well, I mean, and then, and I'm not gonna during slavery too right. okay what is your point you move and on also, like they still have racism done against them i don't know if it was michael jordan or lebron james house that had like stuff put all over it yeah minimum like, wage being 725 is the greatest strife against humanity that america is doing because what is seven dollars and 25 cents what is nothing. not even a chipotle burrito let me maybe tell a you. red bull <laughs> and a pack of gum maybe depending <laughs> on the city 
You can't uh, live in the state of New York on 725 no, an hour. I'm sorry. Just like everything else is rising, the cost of home, like everything else goes up. Why ain't the minimum wage moving? If we raise the minimum wage, then our rent will go up. Our rent is going up. Yeah, it's been going up. <laughs> It's Most people real. can't on minimum wage can't afford an apartment where they live. Like, and then, and then you have the problem where like you people are getting yes. pissed right now in Boston because like some places aren't always able to like do online pickup because they don't have enough servers and they are trying to do like the fifteen to twenty dollars an hour, but people just they're like, oh, I don't have to work at Chipotle, so why would I do that? Mm -hmm. It's like. Also, you need the people who work at the place to be able to live like within thirty minutes of it potentially. Yeah. <laughs> like, but they can't exactly. afford like rent here is like fifteen hundred a month for an okay living arrangement with three other people, like <laughs> three strangers who, <laughs> who might murder you. And yeah. Yeah. yeah, like rent. I just, I just don't. I just don't get well, it. Well, that's like the whole, it, that's the issue. Like one of the large issues with gentrification oh. is you go in and you, you revamp these communities, lots of air quotes around that. And then you make it so that the people who actually serve these communities cannot live there and you push them mm -hmm. further and further out. And then who's doing your services? Who, cause you're not doing it. Cause you refuse to do it. Cause it's beneath you. So who's mm -hmm. taking care of your ass? Who's doing your laundry yeah. and all the other nonsense that you want to get done. Cause you can't be bothered to do it yourself. Also, the biggest lie is that like living around white people makes you feel better or safer. I live around so many white college students and I want to punch them every day of my life. <laughs> I used to live near public housing in Boston. So there was a lot of families, a lot of like Hispanic and black families. Mm -hmm. Once the kids, kids egged my window, I didn't care because for the most part, it was a lovely neighborhood. And no one was partying <laughs> all the time. I don't have people getting like almost like OD drunk on my street every night and having ambulances called. No one's setting off the fire alarm in my building. I hate privileged white college students <laughs> with terrible. a passion. I've li oof, they're terrible. <laughs> yeah, this part, black people who succeed are usually entertainers. Um, mm -hmm. Very true. And I'm trying to, I just thought of like a rap lyric or something, but yes, yeah, like basketball or, you know, Wasn't whatever. in the book she talks about? Yeah, it she there? talks a little yeah. bit about like how you have to have some sort of other like, thing to offer to there's to other people taming the masses for so yeah. long the show parties, we've been the circus attractions we have been the nightly laugh and giggle and we are mm -hmm. still being taught to like or made to perpetrate amusement for yeah. them yeah the when she i think this might have been in the same area when she was talking about just how we as when she was saying the subordinate cast have learned to entertain or even comfort the uh, dominant cast when she was talking about that police officer who shot the man in his apartment and then talking about how like the judge and the bailiff like hugs her. Hugs, I just was like, I remember that. And it was just making me so mad. Cause it, when she was saying like, you know, if that had been the opposite, if that had been a black man killing a white woman, one, he wouldn't have gotten no 10 years. Or is a black person in general, and then get hugs and like sympathy and like I forgive you, I'm praying for you. I just that I was I remember the whole that. thing is absolute bullshit. Like there's no way the whole case. I'm oh, sorry, I'm just remembering when I heard it, and I was I was I was at work, and I had a ex cop as a patient, and I was like, dude, tell me about this. Do you think this is logical? He's like, fuck no. <laughs> there's no way. There's no way in hell. <laughs> Yeah, right. And there. she's getting hugs and all that. The I think she said something in the book talking about this is one time she did mention Latinx people. Uh, she I forgot the amount of time she said it would take for on like current trends um, for like black people to catch up essentially with money. I forgot it was like some there was a number towards the end of the book and then she said it and I was like it was like hundred I feel like a couple hundred years. Or it, something. It's a lot. It's a lot. I, mean, I mentioned reparations, but I don't recall her uh, mentioning that in the book. I don't think she did. I mean, it. Th so I think I've read this the furthest away of all of us. So yeah, yeah. Take I that. don't remember. I don't remember that part. But I wish she. I would like them in the form <laughs> you just pay my student loans. I was wondering, <laughs> like, if reparations would help in any way, like help us start to like get a leg up in any way. But how much would it even be? Yeah, that's the well, consider we're going to be out of money in like a week. I don't know if we can <laughs> like... buy all those coffees. Oh, that's what I was, was like. <laughs> don't worry, none of us will have any money <laughs> that always is like, well, millennials are buying too much avocado toast. Maybe you should stop going out for no. coffee. It's not like, about yeah, avocado okay. toast. 
if I don't get that one, that one Dunkin' Donuts coffee a week, I'm sure I'll be able to have, there was an article, it was like the average millennial has $50,000 saved. Hmm? What? How much? It was like $50,000. So it's I like, at this point, we're so used to like the mm -hmm. idea that we're not going to make a lot of money that we're like, you know what? I'm going to take that trip anyway while I got the yeah. money in my account because I'm usually broke. So right. I'll go to Puerto Rico while I can. I could die you, might get hit, yeah. you might get hit by a bus. I might as yeah. well eat this toast. Do you guys <laughs> want to know a really other like fun thing about capitalism is I know somebody in my life who somehow miraculously has paid off their car loan and their student debts and they went to college during like the recession. So they've done both of those things. They make six figures. They cannot get a credit card. Because he hasn't paid off, a, like, he hasn't have any credit on his history in the past two yeah, years. Establish. And it's like, but he's proven he's paid off things. Why can't he have I a credit, credit card? Credit is so debt to prove that you have good credit. You need, like, you need some amount of debt that shows that you're managing it. Which, like, how is that a dumb. good system? <laughs> it's well, like, like, don't pay that off too fast. that doesn't have debt. Like, you don't have debt? You No, no. We you, won't. you messed up. I don't want you to pay it back. I want to have someone who will, like, it's literally, like, feels like We want you to get tactics. that interest every month. We want you to fall We want you to have that debt stack <laughs> up, but don't have your ratio too high. I hate it. I hate it so much. My coffee is the one happy it, thing. Flint Gosh, I hate, uh, oh, I hate, I hate, Flint doesn't have water yet. I hate everything. It, it, but yet they go to space. I'm like, okay, cool. I had a friend who lived. I in really Michigan. was wishing that that would just blow up, and we would. Honestly, I was like, I needed that. I was like, anybody else praying for that giant penis to explode? Yeah. Like, <laughs> if only. Sorry. The credit system is is really something. Uh, <laughs> it's real special. No one understands it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you're not the one percent. You're struggling. It's weird mm. America is so anti-immigrants, but the minimum wage is something that immigrants are willing to take and work for. Mm -hmm. Americans are not willing to work for that amount. Yeah. So we have all of the, you pushed us to get all this education, all these certificates, all these skills. And now that we have them, we are demanding more pay. And so mm -hmm. now you guys are looking towards immigrant uh, people to work those jobs because who's going to yeah. pay 25? Well, and also we kind of... We, we accidentally forced some level of undocumented immigration with, with Mexico because we used to have an open border. And then yep. the guy who failed at Vietnam came over here and said, well, I couldn't build a wall there, so I'm going to build a border here. <laughs> and so then they used to seasonally come to America, do the farming job, and go back home because they My didn't want to live in the United home. States. They wanted to live at home with their people. Yeah. <laughs> and now it, they can't do that. Yeah. I see those videos of migrant workers, like, and just, like, the amount of work they do, the speed and the skill they do that and how much they don't make. But it's like people love to talk about them and they're here stealing jobs. Just like you said, you wouldn't be out there. You're not going to do that job, but you definitely want them damn strawberries picked up. <laughs> you want to go to your peach season and I can't find a peach at the store. I'm a riot. So. <laughs> Part of what I'm writing my thesis on is how these big uh, capitalistic businesses will pay minimum wage and rely on the welfare system to fill the gap because most of Walmart's employees also qualify for public assistance. And so they depend on welfare systems to pick up the slack. Um, and so that's how we get like Mexicans at like public charges. Mexicans use up all the food stamps. They use up all this and that. It's because jobs purposely paid them just enough to where you can qualify for 4C, Section 8, WIC. Uh, they do that purposely. It's just frozen. Okay. I was like, it's just I mean, frozen or it's just like utter all. shock. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I hate it all. I hate it. Yep. It's like right now with the Instead of paying them like, people don't want to work. And it's like one I mean, this was happening even years ago, when, right after I graduated. And it's like, why is it entry level, but you need five years of experience? Make it make sense. That does not make sense, sweetie. If it's entry level, <laughs> it should be basic and you teach me how to do it. So it's just like these businesses, somebody, I think it was a TikTok was talking about how these businesses just want to run, run skeleton crews, but make it look like, you know, the American people are lazy and don't want to work. It's like, no, you don't want to pay people. Y'all got, I saw, I retweeted something on Twitter earlier today about like Kellogg's the the yeah. factory on how these people have been working like 120 days straight they're like wanting to lower their pay they have people in different tiers and they make the CEO himself makes millions mm -hmm. himself not the yeah. company like I 
Mm -hmm. That's everywhere. And like the thing people don't talk about with those minimum wage jobs, which I only know about because my sibling had them for a long time and complained. And it was something we couldn't wrap our head around. When you have like a salary position or a full time job, you know what days a week you're working and you know what hours you're working. And that's relatively consistent week to week, whatever that is. But when you work at like Starbucks or like an Office Max or at a Walmart, your schedule is always floating. You could be forced Mm -hmm. to work a night shift and a day shift the next day. And you're not told that more than two weeks ahead of time. And you can't like take off time. And like, I don't know about your guys' mental health, but my mental health needs like a routine. And I don't, I think that's not, that doesn't go away for some people who might be poorer and also have mental health stuff. Like it, I would want a routine and those jobs refuse to provide that because they want to hire the minimum number of people. So they need people to do all of these shifts in weird ways. And then they're like, oh, uh, working at Sonic and working at McDonald's is a high school <laughs> job. But we have adults who are mm-hmm. working at McDonald's because like, where else is are we supposed to go? Like, the system is not working. If you think that when you go to Sonic that everybody should be teenagers, and when you go, you see full adults in their 40s and 50s, that should tell you that some there's a, there's a break in the system somewhere. I've also yeah. been to a Wendy's that only had high schoolers, and everyone got their order wrong, and that's why the takeout line took so long. And so, like, we don't want that. Like, no. I mean, I'm okay with them being there, but if it's only them... <laughs> Disaster. But it, yeah. it happens, like... You see it anywhere that can figure out how to run their business. I saw it in 2008 and it's happening here now again. Whenever you have the ability to prove out that you can run the business on a shoestring budget or with fewer people, and then they will continue to pump that because it just it just makes the people at the top more money because they have more profit at the end of the day that they're not putting out to their employees. And it's, it's literally, it's sickening and it's everywhere. We see it and we're seeing it yeah. in healthcare now. They're trying to, you know, we were heroes. Now we're not heroes anymore. Um, there's a lot of weird things that are starting to happen. As I see different hospitals around me, people go into contract negotiations for their unions and you're starting to see like some funny business happening from the top. And you're like, but come on, like, did we not, did we not do our jobs? Like, <laughs> and, 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 and everybody's, there's like, and it's, it's everywhere. It's like your servers, yeah. all these people, the grocery store people, the grocery store people, I feel like have been forgotten in a lot of this whole personal pan pizza. Like those people were there every day, making sure we had food, putting their lives on the line. Toilet paper. Toilet paper. <laughs> yell, getting yelled at for no toilet paper. You know, yeah. they, they deserve something. Mm-hmm. So what best posted makes me so mad because like if I'm spending so much more on tuition from 1995 and it's not even going to like admin, I'm just like, yeah, we have people who like do real work. Like I remember growing up and knowing that teachers didn't make a lot of money, but they lived comfortable. They had a house mm-hmm. something in a community, mm-hmm. whatever. And now teachers are pretty much down the street from us in like poverty stricken neighborhoods. People who do significant jobs still aren't able to really take mm-hmm. care of them. They're living paycheck to paycheck. I have a lot of friends that are teachers, and it's crazy. So everyone's mad. That's what we've learned. We've already we've learned this. The world. We already have racism built in, so it's a lot easier to be mad. At yeah, her yeah. and having her friend, her white friend, defend her racist experiences was a little. The restaurant thing was weird. I mean, I, I would have been like, a- girl, hush. Just <laughs> be quiet. Just get it to go. Let's go. Yeah, some of them. I well, I can't I believe there's a child care worker shortage. I mean, I can, but like here in Washington uh, for my daughter, it's $1,400 a month. And I would feel like people would be flocking to be paid $1,500 for watching a three-year-old who's fully potty trained, but. I would totally. I, I, I'm right I'm now like about to move. I'm my, like, my idea on life. <laughs> but I think it's that, like, for daycares and stuff, it's not because I saw something. It's like a, the daycare workers aren't getting paid. So I don't know who's getting the money, but the daycares are taking in a lot of money and they are not paying the workers that much. So it's whoever's running these daycares banking hella money because I've heard the numbers people pay for daycare monthly. I'm like, in the month, I expect my daughter's daycare teacher to be shopping at Whole Foods. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I okay, you want that daycare worker to also <laughs> buy your groceries for the day. And, I mean, yeah. and, then, and if like, you're serving her like beefaroni, like no, $1,500, she needs to be eating organic zebra cut sandwiches <laughs> on <beef. laughs> They should not be freshly baked bread, please. Okay, <laughs> better be in the back, of dough up to their elbow. Yeah. <laughs> well, so Sarah, the rule for tipping is tip twenty percent unless they literally didn't bring you your food. 
Is it 20? I thought it was 10. Wow. Then uh, well, it depends on where you live, but if it's like New York City or Boston or anything, you tip 20%. 20. <laughs> yeah. You it's can do 15, but... Yeah. To make sure that they they live a decent life because we're the ones being served food, so we need to support them. Because they're only paid like three dollars an hour. Yeah, if you're around like a, 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 the, they give you like nothing. Some in Washington State get paid like a decent or maybe minimum wage, but when I wait when I bartended and waited tables in South Carolina, I made two dollars and thirteen cents an hour, and everything. So it basically you didn't get a paycheck because that was all taxes. Yeah, so you literally did not get any money if people did not tip you. And I'm like, they're supposed so. to fill in the gap if you don't make minimum wage. But if you don't make minimum wage, you're a bad waiter in the hiring. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So yeah. Also, yeah. I guess I mean I I feel hesitant to recommend this with COVID and stuff, but cash is better than on your credit card because then they don't have to file yes. all the taxes. Yeah, which Always you know all of this is all very weird, and I'm just gonna keep remembering that billionaires don't pay as much in taxes as I do, and I just can't. Yeah. Please That's <laughs> because they have the time and the money to figure out how to play all the loopholes like, that oh, are they're built good into our tax men. system. And no, like, they're not good businessmen. They're, they, they have they get to pay people to figure out how the loopholes. That's what mm -hmm. they do. I mean, like I don't even think there are loopholes for there, me. I know so many grad students who get probably audited aren't we loopholes don't know for do normal it. people. <laughs> they probably aren't. Um, or they have the money to like. When people are like, oh, my God, Bill Gates gave $75 million. I'm like, yeah, tax right off. It's yeah. not like it's like it's he's literally, you know, because you have to give, I think, a minimum of like $10,000 or something to start writing it off. So they have money to donate to write off to get back. Yeah, they bring and, down their taxable income yeah. to a point where they don't have to pay mm -hmm. the taxes Sweet. they should. Because like, I mean, Cause no it's legal. Because it is. No one else here has to share how much they make a year, but like I made like thirty five thousand a year as a grad student. It's not; it's enough to live off of. I'm not saving anything because rent's like you know eleven hundred a month, but like I have to pay four to five thousand dollars in federal and state taxes every year. And the fact that like a billionaire can't even do that, I'm just yeah. like, <laughs> I when they show those numbers. I mean, I don't have a job now, but I worked for farmers um, insurance when I was in Washington. And they also like the state of Washington is a pretty decently sized state. It's pretty big. And they kept us to, we were field uh, adjusters. So we went out when people did homeowners claims. And so we did a lot of driving and they kept our like amount of people so low. Like we were always like basically having to work overtime. They're like, oh, it's enough. And we're like, no, we literally are having to drive across the entire state. Like put more people. And they're like, you know, what our numbers, well, our, our number of claims are down. It's like, well, we're telling you that our workload is up. But you know, <laughs> you know like it's fine. But yeah, I made that job. I made $50,000 a year. It was, which I was, I the most I've ever made in my life. It, I had to have a college degree, but it was not related to my college degree. But yeah, I paid a lot in fucking taxes. And then I'd be like, excuse me, these people making, you know, so that was gross. Okay. I yeah, was like, not I mean, netting. Like, netting. I understand that we can't just do a straight tax system. I understand economics is complex, but like, honestly, my bare minimum would be like, tax them 25% like you tax me. Like, just do that. Just ah, the that. flat tax. That's my favorite way. <laughs> when everyone says it's not fair, so then make a flat tax. That's the only way it's fair. Like I don't know. I mean, I'm at the point where I just want them to pay something, anything. I just get angry. I <laughs> didn't qualify. My problem is that like it doesn't matter. I don't really like taxes simply because I don't know what the hell you're doing with my money. Like I'm not getting much on the other end of it. What are you love doing to, with it? Would love to know. I would like to keep it. If you're not going to do anything good with it, I got credit cards I got to pay. I got stuff I got to do. I could maybe save some. Is like that is that I pay taxes, I vote, and none of the legislation reflect, reflects my money or my no. vote. No. So, well, I'm like, like, right now we got legislation. This is our anarchist <laughs> live. <laughs> this is our <laughs> For those not in the United States, we have such popular legislation right now that is so popular and conservative and like liberal spaces and our congressmen can't get their sticks out of their asses to do anything. Every day, I just... Your insurance is 308 a month and you only make 12,000 a year. Oh Holy God. Shit. What? Health insurance is the, 
this is, I, 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 I don't have, I am blessed to have a very scary union that has gotten us a good contract, which we will continue to fight for that good contract because of course everybody wants to get away, but the health insurance is like the biggest key factor. My, my partner and I are both nurses and one of us has our health insurance included and the other one doesn't. And it's like a huge difference, like a huge difference in our, it's, it's, you know, you take a pay cut, they raise your premium every year. You essentially take a pay cut. It's You're ridiculous. Like, I didn't do I anything know. wrong. Like, uh, obviously we have, we're covered through the military, which is not always the greatest. And when I was in the States and had a job, I would choose to go outside of that and just pay a copay or whatever when I could, because, you know, but here that is not a choice, but I'm so yeah. grateful for it because like I take monthly medication. I was going to therapy. My, I have a friend, we take one of a similar medication and she, uh, works for a company under the Disney Corporation, okay? A huge corporation, supposed to be great insurance, and her copay for the same medicine is like two, three hundred dollars a month or something. I'm like, it's your copay? It's all bullshit. It's all bullshit. It's all made up. It's all like nonsense. It's it's it drives me crazy. Like there is no difference between like what she takes, what you take, any of these mm -hmm. things, and they just yeah. sign things up so they can save money on the other. And I hate it. I hate it so much. Yep. I hate it so much. Yep. I mean, like people will stay. There's things that employers can give you to make you stay in a job that environment that's absolutely horrible. Mm -hmm. Just okay. <laughs> don't no staging, no staging. Yeah. No, we we can't we can't. But you will stay in a shitty job for yeah. good health insurance or good benefits yes. because I'm not because it's I mean, worth it. It is worth the bullshit. I think we're all I and I've seen this on Twitter a lot, but it's like we're all so many people are just like one um, un unexpected um like expense or something from like being broke or being homeless like when people look down at people experiencing homelessness like so many of us are right there on the cusp of like one thing going wrong at the wrong time in between a paycheck or you get laid off a job and then something happens and like it I always feel like that's a little dangerous because in America, we have this preconceived notion of what poverty looks like. And so if you are a person that doesn't look like you just rode around in a ditch, you're not going to get sympathy mm -hmm. for because it's like, oh, you have a phone. You're not yeah. used to acquire a phone. You get Somebody a said something about this in here. That like yeah. you don't deserve basic human rights if you yeah. have nice things. It's like, oh, you got a phone or yeah, just like. They have Michael Kors at Goodwill. It's not that hard to acquire yes. <laughs> when you're living in a wealthy nation as well. Yeah. 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 I did like that she, in the health part too, touched on just like how America, I'm surprised we were like the 17th happiest or something. I'm like, oh, we're that high. We're happy? Um, how, what, what was the happy? survey? Like how many countries? Yeah. <laughs> and when did like, they do it? Like, right after 1950. <laughs> um, but talking, because you know, she also said, bringing up like our maternal health like the maternal we're we're really good at killing wise. moms compared to we other are countries lovely that at makes that. no sense especially you know black women or women of color because of course they don't listen to them and or take them seriously now I'm, you're I'm really shitty at women's health just generally and then you yeah. layer in other things uh, like other I mean, how, factors I think our main way of trying bad. to solve endometriosis birth is still throwing birth control birth at it control and just is the answer to everything it. They're we like everything. White men know what women's bodies need. So no, they don't. Y'all be quiet. Shut up, Texas. <laughs> no, they don't. Um, I'm gonna bring it back to inclusion though. Uterus owning bodies. Oh, because I feel like yes. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> we're happy. We're not. <laughs> no, we're no. not. We're no, we're not. They asked because uh, I feel like <laughs> they asked Jeff Bezos. They were like, "Are you happy?" <laughs> he I mean, said yes. <laughs> Well, like, I mean, I think I'm lucky because the one good part of my health insurance through my university is they realized, oh, grad school is really good for depression. We need to make sure they have good mental health. So my copay for therapy of any type for med $10. I can do anything psychiatrist $10. My Lexapro is free, but my inhaler is like 40 bucks. Yeah. Like, if you want to breathe, you need to give us money. But we'll yeah, get it in the military, so like they spend their the American defense budget is ridiculous, but it's funny because I mean they spend a lot on military members, but like individual military members, if they're not officers, don't make a lot of money for the work that they do. Millions of dollars on the military, they mean toys that go boom boom in the yeah, yeah, so I mean, tanks <laughs> and jets, and they're not, not even like the good people. toys, like most of them just break, like most of them are poorly designed, like it's not like. 
Or they just sit in big old hangers. They're just there. Well, like that's where all that money goes. It doesn't go to people. Like yes, they it goes to people, but like no, it don't go to the people <laughs> in the military. They're like, no, we can't. We're not doing that. Uh, Literally, uh, I went to the military, like what Jess said. Unless you're a NCO or higher, uh, you probably make as much as a waiter. <laughs> <laughs> Overtime? Because that's not a thing. Like, they go on deployments and work 12, 16-hour days. They don't get paid overtime. They're just, like, on the... I went to... Anytime I go to, for an appointment, like, down um, here at the hospital, <laughs> they literally, like, typing in the information. The computer looks like one of those black and green screen computers oh, from, like, 19... <laughs> I'm like, excuse me. Watching an episode of Lois and Clark right now. That's how it <laughs> like, felt. <laughs> It's just like, just, I'm like, that's what y'all are using. So yeah, it does not go. Because it's it not goes, a boom boom thing. So they yeah. don't care about it. Well, like America's military spends five times the amount than someone in like Russia. And they have like three times the amount of people. We spend more than anybody else in the world than China and Russia who have billions, uh, literally like close to a billion people in their army. So it's like, you know, that's how we stay number one in the military. If you ever want to know why our military is still number one, we spend way more money than other people are willing. Like, you know, everybody's mm -hmm. like, you know what? I'm out on this round. And you then when she talked the about the prison point. population, because she compared that to, she said, we, because of course we have the highest incarceration in the world, um, higher than Russia and China. And so our rate is 655 people per 100,000. So 2.2 million people. That's a, that's a lot. It said the incarceration rate in America is so high that the line representing the United States extends well off the page in graphics of the prison rates in the developed world. Uh, Aren't you so know. proud? I'm so proud. Proud to be it's an American. If our, get my American flag shawl out. Like, if our prison population was a city, it would be the fifth largest city in the United States. What would that be like Philadelphia? What's our fifth largest city? I don't because what's the first? Is it LA? New York? Oh, let's look I at don't think it's New York anymore. I thought it was New York. Give me some stats. <laughs> All right. 20 largest city in the United States by population. New York City's got about 8.6 million. Oh, Los Angeles, it. 4 million. Chicago, 2.6 million. Houston, 2.3. It's 3. Philly. Six is Philly. Five is Phoenix is what I got. Oh, see, I have six, uh, five Philly, six Phoenix. This is I based off the, the 2021 moved. something, but I don't know how accurate Maybe this is. Maybe people. That's still shifted. ridiculous. But this is so in. Um, Phoenix is populated, so yeah. People. What book was it? It was by Angela Davis. Um, she was talking about the interconnections between stuff like corporations that run prisons worldwide, and like how all of that is tied together. I can't remember the book, but privatized hmm. prisons. It's mm. my origin story. I mm. really, really, it really grinds my gears because yes. people making millions of dollars off of a population in prison encourages them to put more people in prison of course, because yep. paid by the head. I also just like, I, I mean, there are obviously, there are a, a percentage of people in prisons who have done heinous things that I, like, I don't wish them much of any joy, but the most often it's just someone who happens to be brown or black and like did weed at some point like that's yeah. most of the people then, in prison you could take out everybody who got arrested on a weed charge you probably yeah. would significantly dent but they're like not even like allowed like to own a book like like the lack of humanity that exists because like my dad had to be in prison for a while people? and it's just like it was so hard like my dad's not a bad person that? Uh, yeah. The space exploration was just a competition to see who had a bigger dick between America and Russia. That's why. We <laughs> <that>. Yeah, <laughs> it was. Uh, <laughs> we're number one. Okay, I found that stat she put in here about the happiness. She said, um, "She said the United States ranked 18th in happiness in the world, just above the Czech Republic, according to the Consortium of Organizations." Um, that publishes these results each year. You know, I wonder how people do these surveys. So, you know, like- No one's ever asked me if I'm happy. No one's ever asked me, but also like with all of the spamming I get in my texts and my phone calls, like I'm not picking up an unknown number or anything. So like, how does anyone even get surveyed these days? <laughs> That's an excellent question. I do not, if it's unknown, oh no. Like if someone has tried to call me or text me a survey, or I assume it's a virus and I don't engage. 
<laughs> exactly. Now I gotta look up that book. It wasn't Our Prisons Obsolete because I haven't read that one yet. Oops. It's um, what's it yeah. called? I I don't I don't I don't think prisons are a good use of my money, and I don't think they work very well. But I haven't done any research on that. That's just my gut feeling as a human. Oh, freedom is a constant struggle. Is the oh, book? Oh, I, I think I've read that one. It um, sounds very familiar. I do want to read Our Prisons Obsolete because I didn't I read that one. Um. Like we just said, you know, the majority of people are nonviolent offenders, majority black and brown, a lot of things that people need help for, like putting someone with an addiction to a drug in prison is not helping them. No. Or a lot of things is mental health related. But I want to read more on it because I just don't know what the alternative is for when there are people that I feel like should be in prison. You know, like some people I'm like, oh no, you know, that person needs help. And then some people I'm like, no, I want you to rot under the jail. So what do we do with them? <laughs> so I, I need I to, you to rot under the jail. Yeah, under. You don't need to, you don't deserve light, okay? <laughs> like, that's yeah. not the hole and it's, it's yeah. actually like against the Geneva Convention, well, I think, maybe. Like, I think it'd be interesting <laughs> to compare it. I, I think in Iceland, they have um such a pleasant prison system that people choose to like get imprisoned there instead of other countries when they have to because it's a nicer experience mm -hmm. this is a so. good thing to know where and where not to go to prison <laughs> i mean i could be saying that wrong i don't know for sure yeah the just like in um the new Jim Crow, yeah. she talks about like the it's the new slave labor. It is the new yeah. way. To and the, like the pipe, the prison pipeline and how mm -hmm. so many people, especially if you get one small offense, how difficult they make it. Cause she talked about well, like, the you war on drugs. For, like your ankle monitor and like all these things, especially if you can't be back in that area. So now you got to go find somewhere to live, but you got to get to your probation meetings, but you got to get a job, but nobody will hire you because now you're like the cycle that it puts people in. And of course it would make sense if they're like, yeah, get them back in here so we can pay them a penny and I can make all this money. Oh, and then you got like the whole bail system that cats people put thrown into jail for a number of days just for the stupid bail system. And I think we're like one of the few countries that even has a bail system. Mm. There's there's a lot. There's a oh, lot. I'm That's like, a whole different life. Well, yeah. you can't even afford. Uh -huh. Yeah. And you got for from a bounty hunter, and that's a whole nother thing. Yeah. So many people like I think it was was it what Khalid? is the police Khalid education? Crowder? Yeah, what is uh, police education? They don't get that. Don't what get is it like that. six weeks? They don't it's not well, an education. They get a, a little trouble, a little boot camp. If you They're get, like run <laughs> as a ooh, as a prison library, I could tell you the effectiveness of a prison is based on the staff employed. Yeah, and no. I have a weird I love to this sounds bad, but oh, I Bonnie, I need to talk to, watch to you TV with that's reality TV set in a prison. And I feel like all of those people in the prisons, the majority of those people are like underpaid, overworked. And so they're not great people to, you know, staff. I'm sure there are prisons that have people who like want to help rehabilitate people and some prisons that actually have really helpful programs. But it seems like a majority of them are overcrowded under somehow underfunded but making a lot of money well, it's, it's the same thing with everything you can't do anything in absolutes there's always going to be yeah. like the better to the option to the thing that that is the majority but i think the majority of places are not they're not rehabilitative they are about mm -hmm. just being punitive and continuing yeah, to pipeline people in there's a lot of programs they're limited they only help you know 10 people every whatever certain amount of months they don't have enough people who are qualified to really be helping uh, people in there. In the Emancipation Proclamation, there's a line that says that you can't invoke slur slavery or like involuntary servitude unless as punishment for a crime. Uh, so that one line, I think originated the entire prison, uh, you know, to pipeline kind of thing because well, we can't force them to work, but here's our entire economy. They've been based off black people working. They're the more equipped and skilled in the field. They've been our cotton picker. They've been our agriculture growers, uh, but now we have to free them un unless we make their job that they've been doing for hundreds of years a punishment for a crime. Mm -hmm. So we need, to convince, mm -hmm. we need to convict them of crimes and put them in prison. Uh, so I think that's a huge part of why we were the original uh, forefront in, in terms of going to prison because it made it legal to force work upon us. Yeah. Just, it's, um, yeah, I just, um, I, 
to think about because Naomi and I were talking on the podcast the other day about um, when we did our last recording about the whole war on drugs and just mm-hmm. how much that was used to control and imprison black bodies. And oh, when and, I learned the, about that in white rage, I rage. And how much? <laughs> no, just think about how like the whole opioid epidemic right now and how just who started it? Was it Reagan or Nixon started the whole? It was, was it Reagan? Reagan? It was Reagan, the, and it was a thing with the, the and was, Yeah, and it's so like, it well, how did they get to these neighborhoods? Who was bringing in the in the ships or in the boats? Or in the it was planes? a bunch of white dudes, and it was fine to be out in California and be a rich white dude and blow it all the coke you want up your nose. But if you wanted to be a kid on the streets in the, like the Bronx, then you're criminal. Mm-hmm. Like yeah. it's it's no. always how is it different? It's not different they're unless you make it racist in white communities the RCIA was selling drugs to fuel money for cold wars and proxy wars so the same drug that you were purchasing and selling to militias and you know guerrilla armies you were also managing to funnel through the black neighborhoods it's like a two birds one stone kind of thing mm-hmm. to find out that the government who pinned it on you are the real drug dealers mind-blowing mm-hmm. <laughs> i showed that i made my mom read white rage and like she d- she was so shocked and she's like i can't believe i voted for that man twice it's like it's okay you're not the only one <laughs> <laughs> you can do it on your own <laughs> like, you know? economics i feel like are a huge part of why we're struggling today and why our rich people are not paying taxes mm-hmm. on anything the trickle down theory i want you mean, the, you mean tr- wanna- the money don't trickle down I want to talk to whoever created that trickle down theory. I just want to let... drop. <laughs> I mean, okay, so why, why did we back let... to just this thing of how you need a bunch like... of old white men in a room in a room is why we let that's that's why we let you what do you mean money's gonna trickle down? Nobody just lets money fall from their pocket, they're gonna pick it Nobody. up and just float out of the sky. <laughs> oh, I hate I hate it all. Yep. Now they're concerned about this. Because but. a bunch of white kids died. Yep. Well, the um the the one benefit of um you know the medical system for being prejudiced against non-white people is that we didn't give you as much medication in the um pain meds area, so it's not affecting black communities the same way it's affecting white communities. But the problem with that is that now they actually give a shit because it's affecting white people. But, and now it's like, oh, well, everybody needs to talk about it. You know, we all suffer. now we want to talk about drugs and it being but an we addiction. Don't care that you're overdosing on opioids when we have plenty of people who have died from and then the crack epidemic and the AIDS epidemic. Mm-hmm. In, in that was different. Society. Okay. <laughs> Those were dirty people. Those were okay. different people. Sinners. Filthy sinners. These okay. are victims, okay? <laughs> One mentioned in the book that I do want to touch on before we leave, uh, and, and I've seen people say that, like, you know, the anti-Asian hate uh, legislative that we got kind of as soon as, you know, COVID started targeting them is people saying, like, oh, America's just further racist and that, you know, it cares more about Asian people or whatever. But she mentioned in this book something that I share, which is that there is no African country in the world that can save their diaspora so china is a world power and so you're not going to be able to target even if it's just a small community of them in any country because their country has a say so there's no african country that has a military uh strong enough with enough funding that can come and liberate uh us in the way that they were able to do for example the jews when israel came together like they started liberating jews that were under oppression in certain parts of the world because they had the military and the economic like an international recogn- recognition to do that. Um, yeah. And so I feel like a lot of reasons, that's why we are still struggling is because we don't have a country that we can be like, it's going to be like, you know, you're going to stop doing that to them because we're being exploited everywhere, no matter where you look. And she didn't mention that in the book. And I felt like that was so significant to understand as to why other people get justice a little bit faster than we do. Mm-hmm. Uh, because we don't have, you know, that option. Yeah. We're like in, this is like, America's like our family, but. But you don't they, like them? <laughs> but it's like, we're here. It's, it's it's such a weird thing. And I always talk about, bring, talk about this randomly with friends or like with Andrew. And I'll be like, I hate that. Like, obviously there's like a Southern, there's like an American black culture. Like, and I'm from the South. So there's definitely a Southern black culture. You know, I love black Twitter. That's my people. But I always, you know, being a black American, you're obviously not, you know, from the motherland. And then here, you know, there are some people who are maybe second generation or can trace their, you know, roots back to a certain uh, country or, you know, back in whatever country. I can't, um, I don't, we don't have great 
records or whatever past like my grandmother. So I always feel like this disconnect, you know, people who are like, oh yeah, my grandma's Polish or whatever. And they have these recipes and traditions and all of these things. And so I've always missed that. But then it's like, so I am, I'm black American because of the history y'all brought us here and then through yeah. whatever and whatever. But then you also don't want me here. But then I have nowhere else I want to go. You. I have, there's no one, like we only have ourselves. There's no one, like you said, no power to fight for us. But it's not like when they're like, go home. But that's not our home. <laughs> that's not where we, like technically a while ago, we came from there. But like, if you drop me off in Nigeria, that's not my home, my home. But even, even then, though, these are people that have been in like, for example, the Operation Solomon, where they lifted all those Ethiopian Jews. Mm -hmm. They had not been in Israel for generations. And like mm -hmm. Israel is a different story. So I don't want to keep using them, but. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> For example, the Japanese in America, we did put them in concentration camps, but Japan is a, is a country that has international recognition and like their army is formidable. And even though they lost the war, we still paid them reparations. Mm -hmm. How do Japanese people get reparations for 10 years of, you know, oppressionable treatment? And we didn't. It's because, again, we have another country where they have the standing in the military to support. We Like in the book, she said that we don't have a country that's willing to pay ransom for us. Yeah. We are without a father. We are without a mother. And so a lot of those countries, even though those people have been here for generations, the Japanese that they put in concentration camps during World War II, they had been here for years since like the early 1800s. But still, even then, just being Japanese and being from a country that's respected, they're going to be like, no, we need to do something about what was done wrong to us. Mm -hmm. uh, and I feel like that's so important to keep in mind as to how we're viewed all across the world. Because even if you go to Brazil, you go to Haiti, you go anywhere else, Black people are always going to be uh, oppressed in some way. It's because we don't have that mother country figure that's going to be like, no, you need to give them the rights that they deserve or we're going to have a problem internationally. Yeah. yeah. Our own, you know, our, it's your own, it'd be your own people. Yeah, it, yeah. It's very like, I get really, like I recognize the privilege of like being born in America, even with all the bullshit and the nonsense, a, a still a privilege of being born in America and you know, things that I had, even if we didn't have a lot growing up, it was enough, mm -hmm. you know, maybe I didn't think so at the time, but looking back now that I'm grown, I'm like, oh, okay, I understand. <laughs> but, and so when people, I can't remember, there was a quote talking about, so I can see, <laughs> Like the ideal, the girl that America wants to be, you know, what she uh, wants to give, but don't gave. And I, I, I hate that it's like when they're like, well, America's, this isn't the America I know, or this isn't what America stands for. It's like, well, it literally was built on genocide and, you know, taking from other people. So like the ideals that they want to be and some of the things that are better because we're from America, I just wish... It could be that, but I don't, I'm very negative in the, I don't think we're ever going to get there, at least not in my lifetime. I, I agree. When other people are like, Americans are so snooty and, and privileged and, you know, American this, American that. It's like, I'm American too, but I wish that I was experiencing all of the, the snootiness that you guys are talking about because I don't have that same American imperialistic, you know, view that. Yeah people from Europe assume we all have mm -hmm. it's not like that for everyone sure isn't very and there different. is like something very that can be very beautiful about America because it has so many intersecting cultures and history but also so messy like I mean like you said you you I mean you weren't even your family wasn't even from a country in Africa those country lines hadn't been drawn yet yeah. like that when, mm -hmm. when most of your ancestors came over and like, even as someone who like can track down, like I know my dad's from Venezuela and I do know when my mom came here in the 1600s from I think Wales, but even then it's like at my core, it's like, I don't feel connected to either of those things. It's like, I'm, I'm from Cleveland, Ohio. That is like, that's my route. That's my home. And like once the university was like, you're not an Ohio resident. And at that time I'd never lived anywhere but Ohio. And I had this internal thing of like, if I'm not from Ohio, I don't know where I'm from. And there are so many people who like undocumented Americans and people who like ha have just as much a right, in my opinion, to call this place their home because of their mm -hmm. lived experiences here who don't get that legal right. And it's all, it's all messy. And then like, you know, people love having their tacos, but you know, they don't love helping people immigrate, like who give them all that amazing food. Like, I'm sorry, I've been to England. Their food's not as good 
as we have good the greatest food mother places. We have <laughs> other people here who brought good food. Because if you just left our white pasty asses to do it, it'd be Ooh. awful. Yeah. Um, well, every guy I've ever dated, I had to teach them where like the garlic and salt is. I'm like, this must be on the chicken. You must yeah. put this on the chicken. I was talking to someone the other day and they were like, I like food, you know, cultural food, but I don't really like American food. And I'm like, what is American? Like meatloaf, green bean casserole, hamburgers. Like that's pasta. Midwest food. I feel like I everyone thinks America's like eaters of like, I, I would say hamburgers. Like I think hot I think dog. the hamburger hot dog is is where I'll go. Italy, they, think, they think American food is hot dog and french fries because they will put it, look, they'll have American pizza and it'll just have like hot dog and french fries cut up on top of the pizza. And I'm that like, is fantastic. That is amazing. Well, like in our version of not pizza, it's not it, Italian amazing. pizza anymore in America. Our version of pizza has way too much bread and cheese compared to what they do. No, I just ordered pizza. I ordered <laughs> penny alla vodka pizza. So it's pasta on pizza. And and every time my, my boyfriend sees it, he's like, um, that's not that's not pizza. <laughs> like, it's pizza in this house, sir. Mm -hmm. But I think America has this really wonderful ability to the, the or not ability, has this really wonderful opportunity that they never seem to want to realize where we could really make something truly amazing and you have the power and the, and the ability to do that but just it's like you just refuse to ever do it because you're so stubborn to about whatever it is you want to be stubborn about and so you get stuck like you can have legislation that everybody agrees to but now they just want to like have a dick swinging contest so instead of actually getting something done you're just swinging your dicks and like we could revamp our healthcare system and instead of saying Let's take a look at a bunch of different countries and pick things that really, really work, the good and the bad from everywhere and make a brand new healthcare system. We go, oh, I don't want, I don't want socialized medicine. And then it just gets shot down. It's like, no one's saying we have to have, we don't have to be Norway. We can be America and we can take things that we've learned from other things. That's how you make something better is looking they don't at. Learn. They, everything is about money. I mean, it literally Let's go back to where our money put the, us in the beginning. It's about money. Everything to, in America is about money. Is yeah. it about this? But yes, but money. 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 At the end of the day, <laughs> like even above religion, it's about money. Money. That's it. I mean, right? religion's want, a little bit about want money. Claim all of these things. <laughs> they don't want. They want. I'm. You know, they want. They don't want people to have abortions. They want more people to have children. To have more people in terrible circumstances, so they're forced to work. And less. It's everything is about money. And I don't know how you like. Literally, our whole presidential election, the way it works, is garbage because you have to earn money to be able to be the nomination for your party. It's the worst so popularity get, contest ever. <laughs> you get that much money, you essentially at some point have to sell out to somebody to get a corporation to back you because who just has millions of dollars to fund a presidential election, even if you really do care about the people. So I'm like, if our whole democracy is literally based on money and we the people who obviously are suffering under it don't have money i don't understand how we can ever change it and america's so big that yeah. there's no like when people talk about revolution there's nothing it's just, just too hard to coordinate something it's so we I are just, huge it i just huge. don't even I, that point yeah. like you have the one drop rule and it's like oh they're telling you it's about a polluted race and having white supremacy cool whatever but the one drop rule means more slaves means more workers means more yeah. money and now in the book she mentioned that black women are having less teen pregnancy and we're having less pregnancies all the way around now all of a sudden especially in texas in a place where cheap labor is so significant to the economy they're going to ban abortions because the people who are a part of the cast the lower caste there mm -hmm. are not having the children needed yeah. to support the workforce so yes yeah. they're going to make it illegal it's about money they're telling us about everything's money. about money you don't want you to have options you need to be trapped to have that baby so you have to go work in this lesser job and then your child's going to be trapped in that cycle we do not want you to come up like <laughs> It's you can't literally break all of it. or generational curses when the whole system is working against you it's Exactly. Like, and then the, the, the whole conversation and like, I, I watched a, no, I think I listened to a podcast on this about, cause they, it was about Japan, but you know, a lot of countries are experiencing, I forgot what they called it, but they're not, you know, people are having less children. So they're eventually it's something about the, the population pyramid or whatever. Yeah. Um, but there's actually some countries, I think, you know, probably like Norway, Sweden and stuff that are incentivizing mothers to have children, you know, like, 
obviously their healthcare is already better, like giving them money. Like I think, I can't remember there was a certain country, correct me if I'm wrong, might've been Switzerland where they were paying, it's not a lot, but they were basically paying mothers a salary because they are doing a job, stuff like that. And every three months, I swear there's a goddamn article that's like, well, there, why are people having babies? Hmm. I don't know. Because we you know, can't the feed them, clothe them, or house them. I don't know. It's weird. We're not giving birth. Our children are dying at birth. What? And we can't afford it. We don't get the, the welfare system that you guys hate so much. That was, mm -hmm. I mean, baby boomers after the war didn't have to worry about nothing. They could pop out kids left and right. Baby yeah. boomers are our history. We're not doing that anymore. No. I'm we sorry. We I have debt. I have student loan debt. Okay. I see how you treat children who look like me in America, adults who look like me. Um, yeah, no, I don't want to. Do I mean, that. that also just ignores the basic fact of, you know, it's a huge sacrifice to put your body through. Like maybe yes. you just don't want to. Like, also <laughs> that. I don't want to do that. Mm -mm. Yeah. <laughs> like that's you, you don't, maybe you don't want your organs to be squished together for three months in a weird way. Like there's a chance. <laughs> Just a space there's the <laughs> I, it's I mean, also yeah. there's nothing wrong with wanting to have that happen. Yeah. It's just like, yeah. there's just. But choosing to be child free still is like a very, how dare you? Because part of the American dream, you know, your thing is like, everything's on this timeline. You're supposed to do this. You're supposed to go to college. You're supposed to get married. You're Jess, supposed to I told you, children. we need to kill the American dream. I don't yes. want We've already asked. It's what about you, money, death to the American dream. What you just mentioned about the American dream, the communities that are upholding the early marriage and the five, six, seven kids are religiously centered mm -hmm. communities. Uh, so cool. there is something to say for that. Are we going to go down a, 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 a an atheist road, or can we go there? Um, <laughs> I'm here. Look, I'm not. I'm here. Having a <laughs> five year old couple that's married with six kids already feels very Mormon Presbyterian. I was about to say I don't know many atheist couples who fit this description, but it could. No. <laughs> it could. I don't know if they were atheists when the children were born, though. Exactly. <laughs> this I think about. I'm like. No, I'm, I have my dog and I'm like, what kind of world will Nigel have in five years? Honestly. Even Japan, <laughs> like the women are choosing not to have kids as often because they're tired of being the ones like fully responsible, mm -hmm. like, cleaning, the cleaning, the daycare drop off and they still work. Like a lot of Japan is trying to encourage their younger generation to have more kids because the women are like, if I yeah. got everything for them, I mean, no, but we, doing but it. We, we, we tend to, and there are men who do pick up the, their fair share. I don't want to say like every man, but like we women tend to do everything and, 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 and you have to excel at everything. That's un, that's just, it's unnatural. Yeah. We shouldn't have to excel and, uh, at everything. And, and we shouldn't be asked constantly when we're going to have children. Because yeah. there's so many reasons why maybe you you haven't had a child. And mm -hmm. some of those could be very triggering. And why are we just assuming that my whole body is supposed to be for having a baby, uterus, and body? That's what my God, uterus doesn't necessarily need. That's what we were here for. You were from his rib. And you made. We're supposed to keep humanity going. That's it. So then what are you when you, so that's like, I hate those thought processes because then it's like, what are you if you have fertility issues? Are you just a worthless female? So now do I have no value? Am I invalid? If I, Go I mean, clean. the answer is of course, yes. Yes. Course. I have no value. I might as well just jump off of a cliff and, and or adopt them. six children, please. And go Thank from you. there. And in my mind, I'm like, I will be no. the terrible foster mom of the year. And like, that's yes. I'd want yes. children if I could be a dad. No, yeah. Like if straight up, I'm like, if I didn't have to change my body, I would have yeah. a biological child in my whole, your whole life. Cause even if you do have like a supportive partner, if you are the person having the baby still, that's your body. No, no matter how empathetic or whatever, no matter how many snacks they bring you, you're the person going <laughs> through all of this. You're going through labor. And then, you know, especially if you're, you know, lactating or whatever, you're breastfeeding, you're the one who has to do that. You have to go. It fucking hurts. It hurts. <laughs> it's painful. <laughs> There's not a yeah. whole lot that daddy can do for yeah, a while. So it's just I mean, yeah even like after that kid's born if that if that your partner the one who didn't go through the childbirth is the one who takes up all of the midnight wake up calls for the diapers or whatever like if yeah. even that does it's not an equal there's no equal trade there it's never going to be equal exactly yeah. Ooh, no but yeah the relit money on the it boat when he got on the boat did it mention but anyone besides his wife like who repopulated the planet 
if it was just his wife on the boat. And she must have just had so many kids, man. I feel bad for her. Just always the problem <laughs> is, is that how many of those kids had kids with each other? And then is this why we are the way we are? Because <laughs> I, I have questions. <laughs> Wow. Yeah, because how have been more than one boat if we're really we're really really had, how did Cain and Abel have they food? better they better have found another babe of another boat. <laughs> more boats. What a mess. This is amazing. Were there any final cast thoughts or points you wanted to throw in? <laughs> oh, good job, Jess. We, we yeah, yeah, bring it back the moderator. I think I think Monet's points of how this could have been a more intersectional piece and that could have mm -hmm. really elevated it is like something I hadn't like actively thought about but I think is like super I mean obviously super valid but like it's something that could have been done without sacrificing the this is an introductory piece of literature mm -hmm. I think it could have been done that way but I mean I still like I I still would give it to the parts of my family that I was like, they're not that bad, but I bet they might've voted for Trump, but I bet I could make them see why, you know what? Like there's that sub, that part of the Venn yeah. diagram. That's like, there's one woman you know, like who, here. Just the people who have hope, there's here. like this little glimmer of hope. The people that are worth calling in who, who's, yeah. who's whoever came up with the phrase instead of calling out, calling in, you know, yeah. this is a book I would attempt to use because I do think comparison to cast removes I mean, I don't think people should be mad when you say words like white supremacy and racism. Like, yeah. I feel like people should not be so defensive about these things, but, but, but they are. Yeah. <laughs> but I think oftentimes that barrier? that's a huge key to getting a point across is changing the language to something mm -hmm. that's more palatable yeah, because, because yeah. you're trying to get it into somebody's brain. And if we take away the things that are just going to immediately put up a wall because people are mm -hmm. like, Oh, I'm angry, then maybe you can put that seed in and actually yeah. start to affect some change. So I, I like that she used a different word, even though yeah. you could have made it stronger and used more like powerful imagery or words or yeah. but like it's kind of it, as that introduction piece. I think it's yeah. it's a good this way to less scholarly, get in there. Yeah. Definitely like it's not an A plus book. This isn't yeah. an A plus thesis, but it's, yeah. it's, <laughs> good. It's, it's fine. Yeah. I mean, she got her point across and it definitely for introductory, because, you know, a lot of people think you're like, oh, nonfiction is dense or hard to read. And even when I just read the physical or if you do the audio, it definitely is more like a narrative style. So, yeah. I mean, yeah. Robin Miles is the narrator. How do well, you yeah. go wrong? You can't, I love so. Robin Miles. <laughs> <laughs> I do like the narrator a lot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll I'll feel like if she does all of Jemison's books. So, yeah. So when I reread, I'm definitely going to listen to the audios. I yeah. Heard that. She also does um, a few Nidia Core for. She did the whole Binti trilogy. I have listened. I don't listen to a lot of audiobooks, but I think 50% of them have accidentally been by Robin. Robin Miles. <laughs> yeah. So this is a stepping stone, okay? But don't let it be. Don't be it. it can't be the only thing, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, I and that makes sense though, what you said earlier about like something super popular not being like a super I didn't even I didn't even think I, I don't think that. something can sense. be super popular and then also super dense and specific i don't know yeah, it won't appeal to a wide audience like so that, even um the nonfiction i really like just mercy you know it's you know it has both a narrative case that became the movie and then all this background about different injustices in the legal system even that is so palatable and cannot touch everything it's very much about mm -hmm. alabama and georgia and their you know how they can be a, a way you expand out and look at other parts of our justice system and how messed up they are. That's why you have to read more books. You can't just, no, no one book is going to give you Everything. all of your answers. You have to start somewhere. And if this is where you start, then great. But you have to keep building on that. And if something yeah. caught your interest, then go down that avenue and explore down whatever that road is. And then maybe you'll branch off into other things. Yeah. Money, has, money has book. Uh, this is America for Americans, the history of xenophobia in the United States. Really good audio. Mm -hmm. And then this is called Not a Nation of Immigrants, Settler, Colonialism, White Supremacy, and the History of Erasure and Exclusion in America. Mm -hmm. Both are really good uh, secondary options to follow up after cast to give a more uh, wider perspective. But definitely, the first book has such a generic title, it's hard for me to find. I hate this. What's the <laughs> artist? Oh, my Erica. pizza's here. Sorry. <laughs> right. I got hungry, okay? Before... <laughs> Everyone, uh, before we, so we didn't vote this time because the last time we voted, cast one and then one vote behind was this one. So Braiding Sweetgrass is the November book. Um, oh, sorry, I got excited. I, by Robin Wall Kimmerer. 
and it's indigenous wisdom, scientific knowledge, and the teaching of plants. So I think this one's a more positive. I don't think it'll be as rage and inducing as the last. Yeah, I've heard it's really a really good one. And um, so I'm, of course, going to get the audio. So this will be for November, which is perfect for nonfiction November. Mm -hmm. Yay. Um, But yeah, I don't know if anyone had anything else to say about the book. We'll be waiting for Monet. You guys made me appreciate the book a lot more. Hey, I'm, 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 excited for, for her. I'm excited for the Monet remix. I, mean, I know, we, right? Like, I um, want to read that book or listen to that podcast or whatever. Art. Okay. <laughs> Signed, personalized. Thank you. But actually, if you do ever publish, you need to get Jess to promote it so we all buy it. Because Jess has yeah, a bigger channel, so that's yeah. obviously where yes. it has to go. <laughs> Are we coming to yes this was wonderful so thanks everyone for joining reading sweet grass i'll probably make a video about this but yeah thanks everybody bye bye <laughs>